Hello, I am Frank Kane, and this is Frankly Speaking, the show where we dig deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers in the region and the world. Today, I am joined via Zoom from Riyadh by Joseph McMonigle, Secretary General of the International Energy Forum, the biggest global organization of energy ministers, and a key part of the international dialogue in the vital energy business. Mr. McMonigle, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Thanks, Frank. It's great to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you. Let me go straight to the heart of the matter. Uh, you are in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are all in the Middle East. Uh, this is the center of the global hydrocarbon industry. But recently and increasingly, uh, oil and gas have fallen out of favor with a number of people in the world, with environmentalists, with investors, with governments. They are, some, some governments are looking to impose restrictions uh, on the use of petrol engines and other environmental uh, emissions. Tell me, frankly speaking, are we in the wrong business? <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, well, as you noted, the IAF is, uh, global, is in the global energy dialogue business, and, and our agenda covers all the energy sources. Um, uh, certainly, big changes and the energy transition are inevitable. Uh, but for me, it's an exciting and fascinating time to be involved in the sector because uh, really new technologies and innovation is what will drive the energy future and help us to achieve our climate goals. But I take the point of your question. And uh, let me just say that we, you know, we just experienced the worst demand shock in history, uh, losing 10 million barrels a day uh, after the pandemic. Uh, but it's still important to recognize that 90% of demand remained intact during the pandemic, which just demonstrates the resiliency of oil and, and its necessity for the uh, global economy. And the consensus is that mid and long term, uh, long term meaning out to 2040 in the, in the different scenarios, is that hydrocarbons continue to grow and are still a dominant energy source. So for example, in 2025, oil demand will be about 104 to 106 million barrels a day. Now, in 2019, as you know, and a lot of your viewers know, oil demand was about 100 million barrels a day. Uh, you know, we lost 10 million during the pandemic. In 2021, we, we think we'll, we'll get it back about uh, five to six million barrels a day. But in 2040, which is the, the end of these long-term forecasts, uh, both OPEC and IEA and others, the consensus is that oil demand will be between 109 and 111 million barrels a day. Now, as you probably know, and many of your listeners and, and viewers know, uh, the IEA has this sustainable development scenario model that basically models in all of the climate uh, goals uh, and, and essentially, that puts 2040 oil demand at 76 million barrels a day. So the gap between sort of current policies uh, and the stated goals is about 35 million barrels a day. So 2040, I think, is even when OPEC admits that oil growth uh, begins to lessen due to the energy transition. But really, I think the point here is that you know, oil is going to be a dominant energy source for the foreseeable future. So the IEF doesn't have a view on peak oil then, or, or do you pull together all the other views on peak oil and reach your own kind of independent assessment? What's your take on when we hit peak oil, peak, peak demand? Yeah, to tell you the truth, we think there's probably a peak investment issue that could lead to a supply problem. So uh, in December, we put out a, a, a report on what we viewed the, as the investment crisis with Boston Consulting Group. And essentially what we, we, we said was that CapEx cuts uh, by companies, but, but also last year by sovereign uh, you know, state-owned companies, CapEx cuts last year amounted to 35%. And this year, they're forecast to be between 20 and 30%. Although I, I will note that the, the state-owned companies have now started you know, uh, reinvesting. Uh, in new upstream development and continuing pro some projects that they had, had canceled in the middle of the of the pandemic, but but going back to the to the energy company capex cuts, it's a big problem. You know, since producing oil and gas wells decline over time, 
slashing investment in new production locks in this lower total supply. So it won't be long before lower supply collides with surging demand. And of course, the result you know, is higher prices and, and more volatility. And that's not good for consumers, the global economy, for governments, and even for the energy transition. And so our report uh, estimated that industry needs uh, investment to rise by about 25% from 2020 levels for the next three years in order, in order to stave off uh, these higher prices and volatility. Okay, I was going to ask you this question later, but I'll ask it now as it seems appropriate here. Uh, some analysts are talking about a forthcoming super cycle uh, in oil prices because uh, primarily of this lack of investment that you describe. And, and some have suggested uh, an oil price of $100 per barrel. What do you think, what does the IEF think will be the oil price on December the 31st at the end of this year? Well, I'm not in the oil price uh, forecasting uh, business. Uh, I will say that currently, I think you know, prices where they are currently are not really ahead of fundamentals. I mean, maybe there's some reflation trade. Uh, you know, certainly there's some optimism, I think, about uh, the vaccine rollout and some uh, generating demand that might happen. But, but I'll just say this uh, in terms of prices. If, if demand... If we're in a full recovery uh, at the end of the year uh, from, pan from the pandemic, um, I think you're going to see uh, demand be stronger and faster than even uh, forecasted. And so uh, if you combine that with what I just said about the investment uh, crisis, uh, you know, I think uh, you know, the, the outlook for uh, higher oil prices is, is, is quite uh, uh, good. Now, I don't even I don't think that, uh, you know, OPEC uh, and, and the producers here in the region are necessarily, um, you know, uh, thrilled with, you know, uh, super cycle type prices. I mean, I think they recognize from the last time this happened that it wasn't good for the global economy. And I, and, and, and I think they've realized now that, you know, healthy customers and a healthy global economy is the best for their industry and the best for for energy markets. So, um, but you know, we have to solve this. You know, we, we there's not much we're going to be able to do about demand returning faster and and stronger than than estimated. But we can do something on the supply side, and and that's really going to take um, this investment that we talked about. Okay, let me ask you about the U.S. Uh, oil industry because uh, uh, because you're an American. Uh, but also because you uh, advised the George W. Bush White House on, on energy too, didn't you? Um, so some people say that this is all the fault of the American shale industry, that they have oversupplied for years in a very uh, financially unviable way, uh, and, now we're, and, and that we saw the oversupply that was there last year, and now it's collapsed in the US. They are three million barrels a day down. So tell me, can, can you make a sensible uh, uh, defense of America's profligacy uh, in oil? Well, obviously, I, I represent 70 member countries now, but I, I get this question asked a lot because of my, uh, my citizenship and my, my previous life, of, of course, uh, in, in the U.S. government. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, look, the, the crisis last year, I think, had much more to do with the demand shock than any supply growth uh, in the US. I mean, I think the market had some time to get accustomed to what the production levels and growth uh, were in, in the US. Um, but because of the pandemic, US production quickly started to respond to market forces and adapt. And, and so as you point out, we've seen a drop in US production at the, at the record high of 13 million barrels a day to uh, you know, 11 million barrels a day, which is about a 2 million barrel a day drop. Or of course, the demand hit, as we said previously, was 10 million barrels a day. So I don't think you could put this on the, the doorstep of, of US production. Um, but at our, our Outlook uh, uh, Symposium that we hosted with OPEC and, and IEA, we, we, hosted, uh, we had a presentation from the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, Vicky Hullab. And, uh, you know, Vicky, uh, before she became CEO of, of Occidental, ran their the Occidental's Permian Basin operations. And 
She just said, look, you know, it's going to take a long time before U.S. production gets back to that 13 million barrel a day level because of this lack of investment problem that you really do need consistent investment, especially in the shale sector, which uh, is a little different from the geology in other parts of the world that you have to, you know, the, the, the wells get depleted 70% in the first year. So in order to maintain current levels of production, let alone growth, you have to constantly be drilling and investing. And that's just not happening in the U.S. now. Let's stay in the U.S. for a moment, because, of course, we're seeing some uh, some some tragic scenes uh, in the West, in Texas in particular. Uh, and Vicki Holub, uh, she, she seemed to uh, cast some of the uh, responsibility for this onto the renewable industry, the renewable energy industry. Uh, what, what's your view on that? Do you think that the rush for renewables uh, has been responsible for any of the problems we've seen in Texas? Well, I think there's, uh, I think since we saw the, uh, the since the, the storm happened, we've seen a lot of hot takes, I think, on, on both sides of the, of the aisle on this. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, renewable uh, demand, uh, renewable energy uh, was affected, but as we've seen also, uh, natural gas was, uh, generation was also affected as well. Uh, you know, I think it's a lot more complicated than um, just pointing at one or, you know, two uh, fuel sources. Um, it, the other thing that I don't think a lot of people internationally know, I think in the U.S. it's fairly well known that Texas has its own uh, uh, grid that's isolated from uh, the rest of, of the U.S. grid. And, and in other parts of the, the, the country, you know, you're able to bring power in from other other areas to sort of, um, you know, ride out conditions like this. I, w- one thing that Vicky pointed out yesterday that this is a like a hundred year type of event that that happened. And so even if Texas did have, uh, you know, uh, connections to outside of the grid, the whole region, uh, a huge swaths of the of the United States were in this very severe winter situation. So I'm not sure having interconnections to other parts of the Southwest would have necessarily uh, helped here. Um, But I I do think this, you know, it does, it's worth pointing out, um, you know, that I think we have to be very careful uh, about severe weather now. And I think we're seeing it all over the world, not just in the United States. I know it gets pointed out with, you know, forest fires in California and obviously in Australia, the fires uh, there. But this, the Texas regulator that was responsible for keeping, um, you know, the power uh, going, uh, basically they, they had done all sorts of game planning for certain events and they had a severe weather scenario. And this scenario, which again, as, as she pointed out, was a hundred year type of uh, event was was like 25% worse than even the severe weather uh, scenario that that uh, they had planned for. So I think the message is we have to start planning for the unthinkable type of weather events because of climate change. And, and so uh, uh, this is something that I think policymakers are going to have to grapple with. 2020, as you said, was uh, a, a bad year for oil. Uh, But what seems to have pulled us out of it was the coordinated uh, cuts actions by OPEC Plus in particular. Uh, This, of course, is the organization uh, led by Saudi Arabia in partnership with Russia, the two biggest producers in it. Tell me, how do you see the dynamics of that relationship moving forward now? Well, I've said many times uh, that OPEC Plus, I think, has been quite responsible in stabilizing oil markets uh, during the pandemic. And uh, of course, like every other producer, it had to adjust its its demand lower. But really, they took a leadership role um, right out of the box, uh, and and I think you know really only to their uh, quick action were prices able to stabilize during the summer. I think if we if if, if they had just said let's wait uh, and just you know see how market forces affect everything. Um, I think it would have been a much pain, more painful um, uh, period, uh, transition period. So I would say so far, uh, certainly, you know, this year, I think they've, they've proven um, as a very responsible uh, player. Um, 
I think so far they've proven, you know, to be a very, that it's been a very successful collaboration. Um, obviously there are disagreements. Uh, there's probably lots of disagreements on, on prices. Probably everybody has their own, uh, idea of what, where prices should, should be. Um, and, uh, I think as prices go higher, I think there's going to be some members that are going to want to, uh, make modifications to, uh, production, uh, levels. Um, but I think they know that, um, they've had success f- working together and, and so, um, I, you know, I, th- I think uh, that that will help them as they uh, as they proceed here in, in the future. Energy transition seems to be the phrase on on everybody's lips at all the big energy forums these days. Do you think that the IM, IEF in particular lays enough uh, emphasis on renewables as opposed to hydrocarbons, you know, wind, solar, uh, uh, hydrogen, nuclear? Uh, or, or are you still looking at fossil fuels uh, as the main driving force of global energy? Well, my predecessor, uh, before I got here, actually started uh, a, a collaboration with uh, the EU on, um, on the sort of uh, the green energy deal. Uh, in fact, next week, we're going to be hosting uh, the IEF EU uh, uh, Energy and Climate uh, Symposium. Um, and, and he also hosted the first ever collaboration between the IF and, and Irina. Irina. Now, the IF was founded uh, as a forum for producer countries and consuming countries, really mainly OPEC and uh, uh, the IEA, so OECD countries uh, of the IEA. So r- literally producing and consuming countries to get together and talk because they, they didn't have any kind of forum uh, to get together and talk. Since then, we've grown to 70 member countries, more members than both of those organizations combined. And so we have a much more diverse uh, membership. And, and so our agenda has expanded outside of just fossil fuels. And we're very involved in, in the energy transition, what's the role of natural gas, and, and, uh, and obviously paying very close attention to, to renewables. And so I think, you know, sir, uh, on a global stage, I think renewables are certainly getting a lot of attention and, and you know, certainly the momentum uh, uh, initially was because of, of climate imperatives. But really now I think it's being fueled by attractive economics. I mean, just look at in the UAE, uh, it's, you know, that's one of the, the, the leaders in renewable energy investment and, and power deployment in the Gulf. IRENA, you know, the International Renewable Energy Agency is headquartered in Abu Dhabi. Uh, right here in Saudi Arabia, they've announced a $10 billion investment in renewable power and, and have set a goal for half of their energy, their electricity to come from clean energy. So I th- certainly I think there's more opportunities to deploy, uh, deploy and invest uh, in renewables, and we encourage it for sure. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that wind and solar energy alone can't really help us meet our climate goals. Yeah, we really need to shift uh, now uh, by governments and industry to invest more in clean energy R&D, technology and innovation with a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You may recall, I, I know, Frank, you follow you know, the IA and, and, and all the reports they do, and, and they, they really do do terrific uh, studies and reports. And last fall, they came out with the IEA annual technology report. And it was really significant because it really uh, signified, I think, for the first time for policymakers, that half of the technologies that are needed for us to meet our climate goals are not even invented or envisioned yet. And, and I think this is a reason why you see the EU and Saudi Arabia also pursuing hydrogen. There, there's, a, you know, hydrogen is a, is a very hot topic and, and trending topic now. And I think that's because, you know, the EU has recognized uh, intellectually, you know, that, that, you know, what I just said, that wind and solar just can't do it all alone. And uh, we're not going to just go off of fossil fuels. Uh, we need a replacement. Uh, and so that's why I think they're investing so much in, in hydrogen and Saudi Arabia is getting very involved in it. And so we need other technologies like that. Another one is, is direct air 
uh, capture of CO2. And so there's a lot of technologies that are going to be needed. And um, so I think it's more than just renewables. It's more about uh, technology and innovation now. Okay. Uh, and of course, one of those technologies is uh, electrification and uh, EV electric vehicles. Uh, Mercedes say that uh, half of their profits will be coming from EV by the year 2030. Do you see that as, a, as, as the biggest risk, the most significant risk to the hydrocarbon industry? Well, look, I think there's tremendous momentum behind EVs. Uh, last year, you know, there were 2.2 million EVs sold globally. That's about one in every 40 cars sold, uh, you know, was an electric vehicle um, or a hybrid. Uh, these numbers are only going to grow. And, and some forecasts suggest that global EV sales uh, will make up more than 50% in most vehicle segments by the year 2035. And, and you may ask why? Well, a lot of it has to do with public policy. Um, for example, the UK announced a policy to ban the sale of gas and diesel vehicles beginning in 2030. Uh, Denmark has a 2030 goal for uh, zero, emission, zero emission vehicle sales, and Norway is pressing for 2025. And of course, they've done tremendous things. You may have seen the, the recent Super Bowl commercial poking fun at a competition between the US and, and Norway mm. and electric mm. vehicles. And that was a GM commercial, General Motors uh, commercial. And that's because they had this recent announcement that all of its vehicle sales by 2035 will be zero emission. Uh, there's a lot going on in China, too, by the way, on, uh, 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 in terms of a policy push between, behind EVs. Having said that, there are still technology advancements that are needed in terms of battery costs, uh, the, the amount of time it takes to charge uh, the battery and, and the issue of vehicle range. And, and that's why I think, you know, I go back to the previous discussion we had regarding um, uh, the need for government and industry to invest in R&D. I'm pleased to see also the GM in announcing this, this plan also announced $27 billion over the next five years on EVs and, and uh, autonomous vehicles. So, um, this is it's the the momentum is there and the direction is is heading there, um, but we are going to need a lot more investment uh, and uh, and really uh, as as I as I said in our earlier in our discussion you know fossil fuel and hydrocarbon uh, demand is going to continue out to twenty forty and maybe some of it gets affected by EVs but you still have you know jet fuel you still have um, diesel, you have petrochemicals that are driving a lot of the growth. One final one, and briefly, please, Mr. McGonagall, uh, the circular carbon economy is a, a, a framework, a strategy that Saudi Arabia has laid great store in, and it won endorsement last year from the G20 uh, as a practical way of confronting climate change. Do you think the world can unite around this? There are some people who are still holding out, aren't there? Europeans in particular. Do you think the world can, can, can unite around the circular carbon economy strategy? Well, I think regardless of what your, your sort of path forward is, um, I think there has to be a recognition that one approach is not going to be necessarily the approach for all parts of the world. I mean, you can pursue electrification in places like Europe and maybe even in, in the U.S. where you have such advanced, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, <laughs> although some might doubt the infrastructure seeing, seeing what just happened in, in Texas. But I think I go back to our discussion about technology. And, and really, I think the solution to uh, climate change and, uh, and protecting the planet is really... Um, you know, a technology solution. It's not about a fuel type. And, um, you know, the goal should be reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And how do we do that? And, you know, you mentioned uh, nuclear. Um, nuclear has to be a part of it as well. And that's, a, that's an off-the-shelf technology, if you will. Certainly there can be improvements. But, but really we need technologies, not just in new fuel sources like hydrogen, but also technologies to remove carbon, like direct air capture that we talked about, or ways to produce, uh, or way, ways to use oil and gas uh, more, more cleanly. And, uh, and so I think that's really 
the approach. So I do, I, I think, you know, in answer to your question, I think the world has to adopt approaches like the uh, uh, CCE uh, and, and, uh, and just be, it has to be more technology focused, but there's a huge need now. And, and in fact, I think one of the, the things that really got the G20 behind the CCE uh, initiative is really Saudi Arabia getting behind it in terms of investment. Because you know, really, on a lot of the parts of the the C- circular carbon economy initiatives, um, or one component of it was carbon capture and sequestration, and uh, you know, up until now, really, it's just been the U.S., maybe the U.K. and Norway and Australia that have invested in it. But if Saudi Arabia is going to get behind it in a big way, uh, that's really going to advance uh, the technology, uh, not just on this, but on on the other technologies that will help us solve um, our climate crisis. Mr. McMonagall, thank you very much indeed for appearing on Frankly Speaking today. It's been a pleasure to have you. Great to be with you.